are sort of international chambers of commerce in Michigan as well. For example, the, the, the most international companies that have footprints in Michigan is Germany, for example. And it, there's a German sort of uh, chamber of commerce, but it's kind of loose net. I don't think it's, like it's not a consulate. That was my bigger issue of why I think consulates are that much more valuable. And if anything, that's like one of my missions, at least before I leave, I'd like try to get some, put us on the track to get more consulates in the state. Because what happens are those consulates are the ones that people go to to get, you know, uh, work permits, uh, visas, and everything else. And then consequently, if they have a good relationship now with Michigan, chances are they can go to Chicago because that's where they have to go through now. So if we don't systemically figure out a way to bring more consulates here, at least the ones we already know we have established partnerships with, and I would say China because it's going to be such a big player in India probably at some point, and obviously uh, Tony mentioned all the African countries are coming online, at least Nigeria. And we had a group of Nigerians in here last week I met with, um, and we talked about trade and export with those guys. And, I'm not the expert on it, but they ask me all these questions, so it has to be some effort. Um, and I guess finally, too, um, I forgot to mention MEDC's involvement with the International Trade Center also, as well as the Greater Lansing Business Monthly, as well as the UCAC, U.S. Export Assistance Center, in Grand Rapids. So I'm actually pretty hopeful that the International Trade Center uh, that uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow just announced last Monday uh, may actually hold maybe the glue okay. to it all. Uh, we are all connected. Uh, we are a partner um, as Michigan State University, and maybe that will answer a lot of the questions and go forward. Yeah, and I think um, if, if you consider the concept of technology parks or logistics parks as knowledge clusters or information clusters, um, and I think that's at a high level, I think that's what we've been I think the response has been focused on. Uh, I think we can't forget about the small and medium-sized enterprises and those small incubator uh, type firms. So some sort of consortium that, that links and, and co connects both incubator firms, small and medium-sized firms, and the big brand, big box brands, so that you have some sort of repository, whether it be soft or hard, of new business initiatives or new public policy initiatives there is some hub uh, from which information is free or flowing, if you will. Hi, my name is Patty McNeil. I'm with First Impressions Training. I've been doing professional business etiquette for about um, 12 years now. And about a year and a half ago, I developed a workshop on Chinese manners, culture, and communication. And so I have a comment to make and then a question. Uh, in my year and a half of research and developing that Chinese workshop, I was amazed at the cultural differences. So as we are going more and more global and we have groups going there and, and, and people coming here, how are people preparing to deal with all these different languages, cultures, and uh, as we try to go forward? Well, I think if you take Asia, just doing business in Asia, you've got uh, maybe Ashan uh, countries, then you have Northern Asian countries, and um, you have pretty much a variety of currencies, a variety of languages, a variety of customs and cultures that influence product design, the way products are sold. Whereas in Europe, by comparison, you have a little bit more harmony among the Western European countries. So it's a little bit more complex uh, problem, to, uh, if you will, for doing business in Asia, at least in my view, versus doing business in uh, some of the more traditional Western European countries. Um, but for, for me, I think the answer is you've got to get your, you've got to pay the piper at some point in time. And someone has got to um, be willing to, you know, make the investment and learn, learn the culture, you know, and embrace the culture. Absolutely, embracing the culture is critical. Uh, figuring out the language, the basics, I can speak uh, badly, I think six or seven different languages. But uh, it's important to at least make the effort. And uh, unfortunately, I come from the era in the, era in the K-12 education system. The foreign languages weren't there. That's not the case today, and that's a major win. Uh, as Anthony points out, though, technology is such that uh, language uh, and trade is becoming less and less of an issue. Uh, I maintain everywhere in the world uh, because of translation, uh, translation software. 
but uh, I date back to the day when we used to use tested telexes to verify orders, which probably I uh, heard a couple people giggle, yeah, you have those in your museum somewhere. But then fax machines changed international trade dramatically when they came online, and now with the internet and the email, we're doing deals in a matter of uh, minutes that used to take weeks to put together uh, in the prior life. So the cultural differences uh, between countries, except for LDCs, those that are just developing, uh, countries that are marginally developed or well adapted, uh, they're virtually non existent anymore. It's amazing. Um, I might also say again, please do use us. We do have some resources. Um, our culture section is probably the weakest because culture, even though it is very related to business, we need still the expertise of people such as yourself um, to be able to bring that to the table. But we do try to show a lot of effort, especially when it comes to China. We now have uh, basically gotten into the habit of bringing China to the table when it comes to doing business in to the Global Business Club of Michigan. We actually just had our um, uh, that session uh, just a couple weeks ago, and we had a panel of uh, successful and unsuccessful uh, business people who have actually kind of, you know, done yeah. give and take, and you know. When the Chinese yes, you say yes, it actually means no, that sort of thing. And uh, there was a lot of exchange. And then we had Nugent um, present uh, some of the success and the failures that they uh, experienced in China as well. Um, so do come and please use us. We do have a doing business in China module, which is free to anybody. Um, and we also do some connections within the campus uh, when it comes, you know, when it, comes to the language itself and not the business aspects of it, that we cannot absolutely provide the expertise, we actually have the connection. We are also connected to the other 31 cybers in the nation. Um, UCLA, highly competent when it comes to business languages. Um, so business language is another trend that actually, uh, you know, both us as the College of Business realize it's important as well as the College of Arts and Letters, the CLEAR uh, Center for Language Education and Research at MSU, which is also the federally funded arm of it. Uh, we're doing tons of, you know, we're doing more and more business language programs. Uh, because I do truly think, I am Turkish of origin, I am a US citizen, um, but, you know, I immigrated here, came to Islam, saying, loved it, stayed here. Originally from Istanbul, big city. Um, love it here. But culture equals language. Um, even though with the technology and everything, yes, it is getting to be minimal at times, um, but it still is there, and the challenges.